Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows. And on this specific episode of the Square Circle Podcast, I will be reviewing AEW Revolution that happened on February 29th, 2020. I did not see it live, so I had to stay off of social media to catch the playback, if you will, the next day, meaning Sunday. On Saturday, February 29th, I was with JD Alpha on the road, traveling with him to New Jersey to witness the brand new promotion of Titan Championship Wrestling that debuted it that day, I believe. They welcomed the Square Circle podcast with open arms. We got treated with so much honor and it was a blast to be there if you guys do not know i run a wrestling newsletter dedicated to all things professional wrestling including my professional wrestling journey to get back into the industry and hopefully land a job in any of the promotions that i come across or have worked with before or the new goal of working for AEW at one point in my life whenever that will happen that will be fantastic so this newsletter is called square circle podcast dot it is a extension of this podcast that you hear right now you guys are free to sign up with just your email nothing else sign up with just your email and if you do sign up that is fantastic if you want there is also an option to donate a monthly fee to get extraordinary content such as more interviews more vlogs more in-depth stories about the business, about the wrestlers, anything that comes to mind, you guys can definitely, your suggestions, your feedback, you could also leave a comment on there. If you guys do not want to You guys are more than welcome to keep the free newsletter as it is. So it is up to you. I'm not forcing anybody. It is however you feel comfortable in supporting the Square Circle podcast. The AEW Revolution pay-per-view was definitely a revolution. They had you understood where these wrestlers were coming from and everything was just place right except for uh the women's title match i think that should have been probably maybe a little bit earlier on place right except for uh the women's title match i think that should have been probably maybe a little bit earlier on it could not have followed up the amazing tag team title match that AEW Revolution had on the card. For me, the AEW Tag Team Championship match stole the show. After watching that beautiful match that probably went It was a beautiful story. Everything that you watched in Being the Elite as well as the New Japan matches, the Ring of Honor days, it all came to a crashing head, if you will. That, and I only wrote down notes that stood out to me. What do we know about the Young Bucks? The Young Bucks have been killing the business for years and they break all the rules. They are two brothers that have a love for professional wrestling and it definitely shows every single time that they ever went out to compete in a match, whether it would be very rarely in singles and, you know, almost all the time as a tag team. They are one of the best coordinated tag teams on the planet. They are one of the best when we talk about tag team wrestling. They would definitely be in that conversation. If they are not in that conversation, shame on you. If they are, when we talk about tag team wrestling, they would definitely be in that conversation. If they are not in that conversation, shame on you. Awesome. The Young Bucks really, I believe, stood out when they definitely made a name for themselves in New Japan. For their biggest fans, they've always made a name for themselves. Uh, they always did everything they could to shine, everything they could to have 
fans remember them, but I think when it it was definitely in New Japan Pro Wrestling with the Bullet Club, with the Bullet Club, with Kenny Omega, and the three of them are gigantic mega stars. No matter how you put it, Kenny Omega has been wrestling everywhere and anywhere, starting from his days in Canada all the way here to the states. Now it's been such a very, very, very long time and a very long career that Kenny has. Kenny has one of the most prolific wrestling careers around, and if he's not talked about in the debates of who's the best of all time, uh, there's something wrong there because he deserves to be in that debate as well. The dynamic that the three of them have together, they are the best of friends. The one odd thing in this whole dynamic is Hangman Page. Hangman Page is the odd one out. We already know this. He feels like He's not part of the group and he was never really part of the group. Hangman goes to the beat of his own drum. He does what he wants to do and he is great at performing in the ring. I just don't want him to get lost in the shuffle when it comes time to switch his character because he's playing the drunk hangman that you know you drink your problems away but at the same time when someone says something that turns a light bulb in your head you immediately want to tell the person the truth of how you feel like during the sit down interview you know, Heyman just expressing the truth of how he feels towards the Yumba. And the character is growing. I just don't want... Hangman has been doing very well at the beginning of the year. It, this includes his winning streak as a tag team. This includes, you know, where he stands in the rankings. Even though you guys know on this podcast, I could care less about rankings and you know where this person stands where that person stands because i am not an analytical person i am more for the story the athletic ability in the ring you know everything that you bring to the table i knew that this match would be very you have people who are and super competitive people match, who are which super you know, competitive and match, and then they you show your rise and then they 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 show your rise and then Hangman comes in, Hangman comes in, which infuriates that Matt, and then they have this little ball going on, this little ball going on, Kenny Omega 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 on, this little Throughout the years, Matt Jackson has had lower back problems that have hindered him in matches, but he still makes it through the pain no matter what, which that's also an old school tactic, which um, I like as well when wrestlers attack a certain body part just because they know is a weakness, but also if during this time when Nick, 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 Nick is on the offensive in this match, working well, on Matt Jackson's lower and back, then Matt out of nowhere, does try Matt to do does a northern like suplex, but it really during this time when Hangman and Kenny are my notes here. working on Matt Jackson's lower back, Matt does try to do a Matt northern like suplex, Nick, but it really Nick does is not on the offensive in this match out. as well. And then out of and nowhere, then sometime Matt later, a power driver does a mess that takes up the and Nick is on the other side of this match as well. When Hangman does and his moonsault, out of nowhere, it is Matt amazing does to look a at. Power driver really, 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 really amazing. Hangman, according to my notes here. There and is then, also a Canadian later, destroyer in this match. Hangman does Nick a moonsault does a that takes up the Hangman page. He does that to the outside. Sometime later, when, and then sometime later, Hangman does a moonsault that takes up the Young Bucks. He does that to the outside. When Hangman does his moonsaults, it is amazing to look at. Really, 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 really amazing. There is also a Canadian Destroyer in this match. Nick does the Canadian Destroyer to Hangman Page. And then sometime later, Hangman does the chicken wing to Matt. Matt rolls through. Nick does a 450 splash onto Hangman in the ring. The whole entire sequence of that was super, super smooth. And that hurt. Watching that, I was like, oh my God, that hurts. You can hear it. The interesting part in this whole entire match, the crowd made this match what it is. This is why we keep talking about the tag match. This is why we keep making memes about the tag match. This is why we 
put our whole attention towards this tag match, and I think that's because of the crowd. Despite all four men doing amazing athletic moves, telling a great story through the years, and it comes down to this, beautiful, but the crowd, the crowd was booing the Yum Bucks. That is a little unheard of. Usually the Young Bucks are the fan favorite. They are, you know, the best at what they do when it comes to marketing and growing them so themselves organically. It's the best out there. And it's one that kind of inspires me to do better at my own marketing just because of the Young Bucks. But to hear the crowd boo them, especially when it was Matt and Hangman in the middle of the ring exchanging blows and the crowd does the famous boo. Yeah. Boo. Yeah. That I was like, is the crowd booing? Is this real? Is this happening? Now we all know that AEW does not pull the WWE tactic of manipulating the crowd sounds Everything that AEW does is 100% authentic. And in that match, everything was 100% authentic. There was nothing that was rigged, nothing at all. And I'm still taken aback by the crowd booing the Young Bucks. To me, it's like unheard of, you know. Kenny Omega will always be fan favorite. And Hangman has a special place in my heart and I think the heart of every fan out there and then to have this happen continue to watch Hangman grow and Hangman develop and I think I want to be there for that as well during this match we also had the Yum Bucks I popped for that I was like oh crap this is actually happening you guys are actually doing the golden trigger to Kenny what and to, to make everything come full circle, Kenny kicks out at the count of one. We're going to dissect that in a little bit, but let me keep going with this. The Young Bucks for a, maybe a Melted Driver, um, but Heyman comes, Heyman comes around, grabs Nick and throws, throws him through, through a table. I am so happy that this was not a whole table spot fest. I'm happy that the table was placed in one spot. Even though I knew it was going to be for a spot way before we got to this match. But thankfully, there was not. You get a table. 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 Hangman and Kenny does the buckshot V trigger combo, which is pretty amazing. It might feel like you get hit by a truck in the train. And then at one point, Kenny Omega tries to do his awesome finisher, the one ring the one winged angel and he can't do it with his right arm because his right arm is killing him. And he's just coming off of a brutal 30 minute Iron Man match from Pac. So his shoulder has not completely healed and he feels the pain. So then he switches his arm to do the attack. However, it still does not work. And this is when hangman Adam page shines in the match. He had his million dollar moment. He decides to do Kenny Omega's finisher, the one winged angel on Matt Jackson. And it looked absolutely perfect. I am not sure if they rehearsed the move ahead of time, but sometimes when you entrust your partner to do your finisher, you want to make sure that the wrestler knows how to do it. And this was super amazing. I was blown away. I I popped really loud for that. I was just like, this is fucking great. You know, he just brings Matt down. And obviously, it's a very safe move. You can see how safe it is. And it looked like a fucking million bucks. So hats off to Hangman Page for executing the one-winged angel, which is a really sacred and protective move when Kenny Omega does it that this looked like the best thing. And the only problem I have is that even though Hangman did the one-winged angel to Matt Jackson, Nick comes in and breaks up the pin. And the crowd just goes wild as if it was the end of the world. And it's like, what are you doing? You know, in my opinion, I felt like that 
took away from Heyman's short-lived moment. And I was just like, what the fuck? This can't be happening. Like, come on, man. Like, but then it was brought to my attention that maybe Hangman should have not gotten the win due to doing Kenny Omega's finisher. You know, it was a nice pop. It was a nice little thing going just to help Kenny because Kenny can't really do much with his shoulder at the moment. But at the same time, I was rooting for it because it was out of nowhere to do that. Um, Even though Nick breaks up the pin, uh, Hangman does the buckshot lariat to Nick on the ramp and quickly goes to Matt for the victory. Hangman Page picks up the victory for himself and Kenny Omega to retain the AEW World Tag Team Championships at AEW Revolution. As much as I love all four competitors in this match, it made sense for the Young Bucks to not capture the AEW World Tag Team Championships just because it will just be like giving it to their friends, you know, just switching it over. Um, I do love the fact that the Young Bucks gave Hangman and Omega everything that they have and gave them one hell of a match. This match is definitely match of the month and match of the pay-per-view and maybe match of the year for me. It was really that great. Now let's dive into some backstory for certain stuff that was done during the match. Um, that is a homage to Marty, who was also part of the Being the Elite YouTube series. He had his own show of Marty and Flip Take Japan. That was the best show of the BTE series. I love both Marty and Flip. Really cool people. Um, the Golden Trigger is a reference to the the best tag team the golden lovers of Kenny Omega and Kota Ibushi back in New Japan Pro Wrestling. So that was a nod off to that wonderful tag team that gave the Young Bucks such a great rivalry, such great emotion and great storytelling on all fronts of all those uh, guys there. The I love how the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, and Hangman Adam Page took so many years of friendship and stories and brought it all into this match for an amazing 32 minutes, probably. So for any fan out there that says there's too much wrestling for you to watch, there's too much stuff to keep up, and AEW doesn't do a good job at introducing their wrestlers and doing this and doing that... The Young Bucks, Hangman Adam Page, and Omega basically summed up their whole entire friendship in a 30-minute match for you to crave and for you to blast all over the internet with that tag match, though. So, instead of saying, I can't watch everything or I can't binge-watch everything, you know, give them credit where credit is due. They handed you their story on a silver platter and all you had to do was just show up and watch and maybe understand the dynamic a little bit more, especially when the Young Bucks completely understand tag team wrestling. And Nick and Jax decided to, to the take the when it came to the situation where it was like, person and down, down, you know, this isn't what that has we should be Matt doing, Jackson then how decides we should be doing it, you know, stuff like that. The uh, duration of, of Kenny Omega's and start shoulder. So hacking I thought that was pretty interesting the dynamic weak and point to see of Kenny Omega protecting Kenny Omega's Nick shoulder Jackson for him. And the, the duration of the match and Matt start to and try to remind him that his hands start to shake. The weak point of Kenny Omega's athletic tape. Nick Jackson you know, comes in and tries to calm down. You don't really want to remind him that this is not the type of match in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the ring and how to keep the people in the
many years completely injuring the voice people of your friend, even though your it. friend is your opponent when it you're came to this to situation where it was like your say matt calm down the other you know, thing is what this whole man is doing when it came to this situation where it was like, hey, Matt, calm down. You know, this isn't what we should be doing. This is not how we should be doing it. You know, stuff like that. Um, so I thought that was a pretty interesting dynamic. And then to see Matt look at his hands as if he had blood on his hands and his hands started to shake and he threw away the athletic tape. That tells you everything you need to know about the Young Bucks, knowing what they do in the ring and how to keep you in the palm of their hands. The other thing too is that this whole match was packed with emotion to the brim. You had the Young Bucks wanting to capture the tag team gold for themselves. And then you have Kenny, you had the Young Bucks wanting to capture the tag team gold for themselves. And then you have Kenny and Hangman doing what teams do best which is working together, even if Kenny does not really trust Hangman Page because Hangman has walked out on so many occasions. But he's the frustrated wrestler that finally made it by winning tag team gold. He did not win the AEW championship. Jericho won it at the time. But to not get the celebration needed and always be the last person to be celebrated, that is why Hangman Page is frustrated. And it clearly shows, and they're doing a wonderful job of doing that. It's just a matter of time of, and this is the next debate. This is the next layer in this story. Who's going to turn heel? Are the Young Bucks finally going to turn heel because the crowd booed them during this 30-minute match? Or will Hangman turn on Kenny Omega just because and then tell him it was a mistake. I was so intoxicated. I'm sorry. I, it never happened again. You know, imagine if that happened. Imagine if Hangman really did attack Kenny Omega, but Hangman blames it on the fact that, you know, he was drinking way too much, you know, but he could still trust him no matter what. Like, have that type of character. Let's see how that goes and how far that goes. I do like the fact that they keep it kayfabe no matter what happens, especially uh, during this new Being the Elite episode, episode 193 at Revolution. I'm just throwing it out there because I love the Being the Elite series and this is not a paid plug for them. Kenny Nick Omega, and Matt Jackson were all Nick together and Matt in that episode. All together getting in that episode, healed up. Getting talking healed together up, as friends no matter what. As friends no matter but what. we have yet to but see we Hangman Page. We don't have an Hangman update. Page. We don't have an update. Hopefully in the next page. being the Hopefully Elite episode. the next being the Elite episode. On this Wednesday's... On this Wednesday's and hopefully on the next being and the elite hopefully episode, on the next being or, the elite episode this upcoming or, or this upcoming Wednesday AEW Dynamite we might end up getting an update from Hangman Page. The whole dynamic is very interesting and I really don't want them to stop this storyline at all. I just need them to continue it with fresh ideas and eventually and eventually come to a twist that no one saw coming at all. That's what I want. So moving forward for this whole storyline, I need somebody to turn heel. I need Hangman not to get lost in the shuffle. And I need to see some fresh, cool takes on this very complex story. All right, so let's head to the beginning of AEW Revolution. It was the kickoff show. I totally forgot to include the kickoff show in my newsletter, which you guys can read and sign up and even subscribe for a low monthly fee of $5 a month. It is squaredcirclepodcast.substack.com. The kickoff. Scorpio SCU, Sky. right off the start. Scorpio they Sky. Start a Scorpio fist fight Sky. with the Dark Order. For a good while, SCU takes advantage of the Dark Order. The Dark Order does not SCU. see the for a good while. SCU takes advantage of the Dark Order. The Dark Order does not see this attack coming, so to speak. So it's almost like an ambush that happened. There is also a point where Eva Uno throws Frankie into the ring post, and then Eva Uno and the Dark Order takes advantage of Frankie Kazarian. Dark Order at this point slows down the match. This match between the Dark Order and SCU is a very good warm-up match. Uh, it is on the pre-show. People still enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. 
a degree. Idea is coming from SCU. Dark Order is great. Dark Order is building the suspense of the Exalted One. And people on Twitter have tweeted all tweeted all sorts of assumptions that it might end up being Matt Hardy had the broken brilliance, the woken will. Woken Williams? No, let's not do that. Have the broken brilliance come in and become the exalted one. People think it's Christopher Daniels. People think that it was Brandon Cutler at one point. People have a lot of theories as to who the exalted one could be in this match. The Dark Order picks up the win. And the Dark Order does what they do best. They beat down their and the Dark Order does what they do best. They beat down their opponents. Out comes the surprise of the night, which is Colcabana. Colcabana had a couple of dates with NWA, but that ended. And now he is signed with AEW. Colcabana is all elite. He comes out to save SCU, but again, the numbers are way too much for Colcabana, even though he's fighting back as best as he can, but the numbers are overwhelming. And then on comes the entrance music of the Exalted One. The Exalted One walks down the ramp in this very lean cloak. And when the person underneath takes off this cloak. It is Christopher Daniels. There is a sudden hush over the crowd as if, oh crap, is he really the exalted one? But Christopher Daniels rushes down to the ring and he attacks the Dark Order. The Dark Order leaves once again. And we know now that Christopher Daniels is not the exalted one. Christopher Daniels never joined the Dark Order at all and Frankie and Scorpio Sky forgive Daniels for mistakenly thinking that he did join and betrayed SCU. This was a pretty standard match. I wasn't expecting a lot from it. I wasn't expecting much. Not at all. Um, Dustin and Hager wrestle on the outside of the ring. Dustin and Hager wrestle on the outside of the ring. This is a little bit dangerous because Hager has an MMA background, so he could definitely use the outside to his advantage more than anything else. Dustin starts working on Hager's arm, which I like in professional wrestling. I like when wrestlers isolate a certain body part of their opponent. So that way, when they deliver their finisher, it could just be a straight one, two, three, bam, they win the match. There's a lot of storytelling when it goes into working on a specific body part. And I think that sometimes it is a lost art form. It can get boring. It can't get routine-ish especially when you do the same things over and over and over again. But sometimes, depending on what type of wrestler you want to play up as, like if you want to play up that you are the baddest person to do submissions, obviously your moveset is definitely going to include isolating a lot of body parts. So that way when you put on that submission, your opponent can immediately, immediately tap. Sometimes in a match, you could definitely isolate a body part just so that way, if you know your opponent has to pick you up for their finisher, they can't do it because then their arm hurts or their back hurts or their thigh is completely cramping up because you completely work the thigh for at least 10 minutes and they won't be able to complete their finisher. That helps your opponent look like a million bucks when they have to think outside the box in order to get the victory over you. So I love the fact that Dustin in this match works on a specific body part for Jake Hager. When they're on the outside, Hager ducks underneath a clothesline and then picks up Dustin to throw him onto the apron. And then while they're still on the outside, Hager does a clothesline to Dustin and that looked like him just him just falling back really hard on the on the floor. There's one point where Dustin does the up and over to Hager. Hager flew in the air and hit his face on the steel steps. The crowd's reaction was great to that. I was even like, oh damn, here we go. It's about to get serious. Dustin here turning up and everything. What surprises me the most is that 
That surprises me the most only because Dustin is way taller than me. He's able to do sunset flips with no problem. He did the sunset flip to Jack Hager and the brilliance about it. And this is how you know he's a vet veteran and not just doing it for the sake of just doing it. He helped protect Hager in that moment of them flipping because it really was lopsided, but the recovery was great and it looked really good. And then after doing the sunset flip and Hager kicking out, Hagger kicking out. This is why it's important to isolate a body part. It's important because Dustin has the arm bar and he was putting the arm bar on Jake Hager and Hager reverses it to an ankle lock, then moves to choke like submission onto Dustin and Dustin had passed out. And that allowed Jake Hager to pick up the victory in this feud of Dustin versus Jake Hager. I was undecided on who was going to be my pick to win. It just didn't excite me. And then the fact of using social media to hype the match didn't really help at all. The fans got behind it. The fans were chanting to Hager, Jericho's bitch. But I don't know if we needed a match ahead of time or something just to hype it up more. Yeah, you know, during the go-home show, you could definitely have these two guys, you know, fight it out and fight it to the back. But, and then the fact of using social media to hype the match didn't really help at all. The fans got behind it. The fans were chanting to Hagger Jericho's bitch. But I don't know if we needed a match ahead of time. Overall, it was not a bad match. It was a nice beginner opening match for the main show, but I just think it needed a little bit more work on the building up side of it, and that's just me. I give Dustin all the props in the world for I but I just think it needed a little bit more work on the building up side of it, and that's just me. I give Dustin all the props in the world for isolating a body part and bringing that back and doing the sunset flip. And I give Jake Hager all the respect in the world. He is a very, very cool guy. I had the opportunity to speak with him during one of the indie shows that I had attended. And he's such a sweetheart. He really is. Um, and then meeting him again at the big event and just saying, you know, Hi, sweetheart. How's it going? And that's it. But he's a very, very, very cool dude. This match, man, I was not expecting the pace of this match. I was not expecting what I was seeing. I was not expecting the finish of this match at all. In my newsletter, I specifically say that Darby should win because of everything ha that has happened to him. So because he's fighting through all these obstacles and Sammy damaging his voice box, now is the time for Darby to kick into overdrive and win. And that, ex that is exactly how this match went down. I will give a shout out to Sammy Guevara on this podcast because when I tweeted out he totally loved it. You guys can also follow me at Marie underscore shadows on Twitter to see what I post and who I post to. So this is what I tagged Sammy Guevara in. And this is straight from my newsletter because I was trying to promote a preview, preview and a prediction to AEW Revolution because I wasn't going to be able to watch it on that Saturday. So this is what I said about Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara is the Spanish god of AEW. Sammy Guevara grew from a small indie competitor to superstar over the last couple of years. He's about an his avid wrestling YouTube journey. creator. He's an avid probably YouTube creator. Content just probably as much uploading and content just as, as much. much. Probably uploading content just as much and fast as being the elite. This is a free, cheap plug, but join his panda fam over at Sammy Guevara on YouTube.
all of that is 100% true. And I am truly grateful that Sammy Guevara enjoyed the fact that I wrote that about him. I had also written about the first time that I saw Darby Allen wrestle. And this was when I was helping out in a, an Evolve show. And it included Roderick Strong and Cassius Ono, who is Chris Hero. I had the privilege of watching Darby Allen versus Cassius Ono as I was sitting there watching this match go on. has and he is a star if darby allen ever did sign a wwe contract he would be wasted he would not survive in wwe and i'm happy that he's in AEW because he does not know the meaning quitting he does not know the phrase of staying down he does not know the fra phrase of giving up he knows none of that he just knows that the right rest of what he does at the beginning of this match in what he does darby and comes there is in at the beginning of this match darby comes in fast and he attacks sammy first like sammy doesn't even see it coming sammy is probably thinking that this is going to be a simple fast match of you know sammy getting the upper hand most of the time here and there Sammy gets up and then there's an Irish whip that happens. Sammy at the last second does do a, a reversal, he does a kick, and he tries to use the barricade. However, Darby reverses that and puts Sammy on the barricade. Darby goes into the ring, does a suicide dive that does not fully clear 100%, but hit Sammy Guevara a little bit, but most of that momentum had him hit his head and bam, it was like it um, looked really scary though. Darby um, was but, able to compete. Darby was able to compete for the rest of the match. Darby's foot did not fully clear the ropes. So that slowed down the momentum and also the trajectory. Hit bam. the floor. Hit the floor. Sammy pulls out a table and does a 630 senton on Darby. Once both competitors are back in the ring, the match officially started. So all of that in the beginning was not even sanctioned yet because the ring bell didn't ring. And these guys took a lot out of themselves. And luckily, they didn't blow themselves up during the match. Darby places Sammy in the gory special stretch an arm bar and then hooks both arms sammy reaches for the bottom rope there is a rope break sometime during this fast paced match sammy does a double stomp to darby onto the ring apron and then darby does a canadian destroyer to sammy sammy does a spanish fly during this match i need to say something on this podcast and i am going to go on record to say that jd alpha and sammy, sammy Guevara. As much as I Sammy, love putting your content over, as much as, as, I, much as I love putting your, as much as I love putting your content over, as much as I love enjoying your vlogs, and as much as I enjoy your wrestling career, in the department of who could do a better Spanish fly, and you are more than welcome. Tag me on Twitter and tell me different. You are more than welcome to leave a comment about that. You are more than welcome to slide into my DMs and tell me how wrong I am. But on the other hand, I will still support you no matter what. It's just that JD Alpha does a better Spanish fly than you. The messed up Spanish fly. Sammy takes apart the turnbuckle. Who takes apart the turnbuckle nowadays? I rarely see it. It's cool. You know, he's in a circle. In a circle are bad people. Bad but fun. Sammy thinks that he's going to get the upper hand when he takes off the turnbuckle. However, Darby monkey flips Sammy Guevara into the turnbuckle. And Darby picks up the win. One, two, three. And ends the match and gets retribution for Sammy destroying his voice box. Overall, this match was, overall, this match was very fun, exciting. I was not expecting the match to have this fast pace turnaround. I was expecting Sammy to most of the advantage and beat down Darby and stuff like that and just be an inner circle member. Um, this threw me for a loop. It felt like Sammy wasn't part of inner circle. It felt like Sammy was just regular Sammy on the indies before joining inner circle where like he'll put on great performances. But I was expecting to have that inner circle feel of bad guy versus good guy in this case but luckily they did not go down that path and this is why i really enjoyed it, it was something different you know it wasn't the formula that we all probably expected happy that darby won because darby was my pick for my prediction
the AEW women's title match. It is Chris Statlander versus Nyla Rose. Nyla Rose, this match could have been way better. Way better. I do not have a lot of notes for this one. It just didn't come off the way that I think that it should have came off. Only because how do you follow up that great tag team match? If they would have moved if they would have moved Cody versus MJF in replacement of the women's match, that would have been fine. That would have made sense. You know, and I understand that sometimes when you book a pay-per-view or just book a wrestling show in general you have to understand the pacing of your matches because you don't want to give the fans a really strong boost of emotion plus fast pace every single match and then all of a sudden throw in like a slow match towards the end you know it's extremely difficult to be a booker and to think about that two maybe three hours tops and you have all these matches and every single match has a different story a different time keep and that's not to like knock the AEW women roster at all that's just because because that's just because you have a lot of main event style matches that need more time and need more adjustment from the fans when you watch a professional wrestling match, you're taking in all the story and all the athleticism in it. And sometimes when you have a great match, you're still running on that high. And if that high doesn't come down, you're going to be burnt out by the end of it and not care about any of the matches. That's why it's hard to place certain matches on a card. My biggest problem with this woman's match was that Chris was trying to do a lot of heavy lifting problem with this woman's match was that Chris was trying to do a lot of heavy lifting with Nyla Rose it did not work out some of it looked like it just wasn't going to work well and the chemistry wasn't there Nyla is not bad either. You can see the wheels turning in Nyla's head. You can't have a match where it's either one-sided or not um, and stuff like that. I just think that the ending of this match where Nyla has Chris and they come down and there's that, that weird, awkward powerbomb. The ending of this match where Nyla has Chris and they come down and there's that, that weird, awkward power bomb that happens that could have Chris. We already that know that a professional wrestling ring is not extra weight. The most safest that Chris doesn't have that's coming down on her object in professional wrestling. We know that there's boards underneath it. So imagine we already know that getting a professional wrestling ring, ring is has not extra weight on you. The most safest Objects in professional wrestling, we know that there's boards underneath it. So imagine getting powerbomb regularly, but have extra weight on you to probably take the breath out of you. Chris could have got hurt. And that's the only thing that I wish that they would have talked about to finish a different way. Um, it just didn't look safe, even though I know Chris is... It just didn't look safe, even though I know Chris is probably okay. We don't need a hundred suicide dives. Need useless moves that don't mean anything. In order to grow as a competitor, you should change up your style or even take it old school with like chain wrestling. And, you know, if you know that you're wrestling a big opponent like Nyla, work on her knees, work on her legs, isolate a body part. I think this whole podcast is going to go back to isolating a body part is good for the business. If at this point you are challenging 
the champion. The champion is always going to think that they're better than you no matter what, that you're not on their same level. So you as a competitor need to make your champion opponent believe that you are the best person there is and this is why you're in the match with them. You don't need to do a hundred suicide dives to get that point across. You can do suicide dives, but everybody in AEW either does a roll up or suicide dive and that's getting pretty tiring. It's like do other moves that fit your character, that fit your convictions this match didn't have it. Nyla Rose is still our AEW Women's Champion. And I think at the end of this match, Britt Baker should have came out to start the angle with Nyla Rose. I don't know why Britt didn't do the heel thing of coming out. So that way, Nyla knows that Britt is going to be next in line no matter what. Even if we do have the AEW rankings, we need to have the first woman a competitor in this angle. Um, I think that would have Cody versus MJF match. This match, man, this match, this match had everything. This match is so old school. What I don't agree was the finish of this match. There was a lot of MJF leaving the ring. That is a typical heel thing to do. You want to psych out your opponent you want to get under the skin of your opponent and that's what mjf does this whole entire storyline between him and cody he has been getting under cody Rhodes' skin cody has been retaining somewhat of a level head because now he finally has his hands on mjf in this match we finally get into the ring cody does his alabama slam to mjf and then the brandy. brandy this is where cody does a suicide brandy. dive this is where cody does a suicide so that dive. way wardlow does not MJF so that way cody does not arm injured brandy wardlow helps out by and brandy mjf focuses on cody rhodes arm wardlow helps out by pushing thing cody rhodes into the ring post so that way Cody can hit his arm. Again, during this pay-per-view, every wrestler is focusing on a specific body part. MJF is focusing on Cody Rhodes' arm so MJF can do the salt of the earth arm bar. I understand the arm bar is a very devastating move, especially when done right. It could definitely dislocate your arm. But as a submission, there are but as a submission, there are a bunch of other submissions out there. Please do more variety of submissions. Don't just focus on what's cool, what's hip. Like, I don't want to see more arm bars. It's bad enough Becky Lynch has her arm bar. There's Shayna who has her arm bar, but Shayna came from MMA background, so I can't really complain. But, you know, again, don't do 100 arm bars when there's a lot more moves there. Don't do 100 suicide cards. Cody Rhodes has in the roads in this to the road submission and that uses the forces Cody Rhodes to get a rope break. break. The with his teeth. Rope break. Cody drags with himself his to the rope and uses his teeth to get the rope break. Then MJF proceeds to take off Cody Rhodes' boot because it was revealed that when Cody Rhodes in that steel cage match, that moonsault had Cody break his toe. MJF exposes the broken toe. First, he bites it. There was a... MJF gets busted open. I don't know if that was real or fake, but was not paying attention to what happened. But, yeah, um, all of a sudden, on the outside, uh, Cody picks up MJF. Uh, Cody picks up MJF. MJF does the heat seeker, and then at one point, Brandy gets into this match again. Brandy runs, does a crossbody on Wardlow, and Cody says, you know, put her down. Wardlow, only for Wardlow to sidestep. Low, only for Wardlow to sidestep, and Cody hits Arn Anderson. Arn is down. The doctor comes out to check on Arn. Cody gets back into the ring. Cody does two crossroads. Knees MJF, uh, but that does not take out MJF. MJF uses the ring one, two, three, and that is it. I was not expecting MJF to pick up the victory after everything that Cody Rhodes went through. Cody Rhodes should have gotten the victory. 
EVP and probably doesn't want to every single win from the young guys. But in this situation, in this particular situation, which is specific to the story, it should have happened that way. Because now I do not see how they're going to prolong this, even though from both sides, the storytelling is done so well. But sometimes you have to end a really good book by doing what needs to be done and that should have been Cody Rhodes winning. It does essentially make MJF a star. After everything Cody endured, yeah, he needed to uh to win that match. Cody doesn't get enough praise. MJF is a good heel. The next match is Pac versus Orange Cassidy was very interesting. In my newsletter, I posed the question, a very simple question, and all I say is why? Do not keep up with Orange Cassidy. I do know that Orange Cassidy is a very unique professional wrestler. Uh, no one else does what Orange Cassidy does. He wrestles with his hands in his pocket, and most wrestling fans do not understand Orange Cassidy. He's he's fun to watch. He is. Uh, there is a story behind him. Pac versus Orange Cassidy was a really good match. This slowed down the pace a little bit for the pay-per-view. During this match, Cassidy had gotten some offense in. So did Pac. Pac does a top rope suplex to Orange Cassidy. This is when they started playing around with the crowd. Pac wanted to do his black arrow finish, but Orange Cassidy rode to one side. Pac brings him back in, tries to do it again. He rolls again. They do this until like the fourth time Pac just gets down and meet him on the other side. And there's the type all of this situation going little, on, which is really kicking cool fest. to watch. Where Before they were all really this, they had their little shin kicks, kicking fest, kicking fest, where they were really explosive shin kicks. Yes, it was a whole comedic wrestling match. And if you're not into that, that's totally fine. But not every single wrestling match has to be serious. This was a match where you can enjoy it. You don't have to be a huge fan of both of them. You could just be a fan of one or the other. At one point, Excalibur says that. Who would have thought, right? There was a point, too, where Cassidy is actually doing some wrestling moves, which you guys should be happy about. He does a awesome-looking Superman punch to pop. Roman Reigns needs to take some notes if Roman Reigns is going to continue to use the Superman punch. Reigns does not know how to do a Superman punch at all. Orange Cassidy does a way better-looking and believable Superman punch. Cassidy does a Stone Cold Brilliance to Pac. I'm guessing that's the name of one of the moves that I don't really remember how it looked like, so I can't really describe it to you guys. There is a DDT from the top rope and also a diving DDT to Pac. Both of them was done by Cassidy. The weird thing was that the Lucha Bros came out to sort of interfere and they got into a brawl with best friends in the past with like AEW Dark episodes and some episodes and Dynamite but I thought that was a weird placement you know there wasn't really much sense they really didn't help Pac win I don't know if Pac hired them like why would Pac ever hire wrestlers to watch his back or come out to interfere I don't know why Pac does everything on his own like he's a loner Pac picks up the victory by doing the Brutalizer on Orange Cassidy. Orange Cassidy taps out to Pac via the Brutalizer. I will say that this match had all the psychology in the world. Orange Cassidy's ability to be funny, to be a wrestler, and to be something different. And I'm happy, and I'm happy that Pac was able to bring that out of him. Pac is a very special wrestler that got misused in WWE, even though I know he probably doesn't want to talk about his WWE days. I don't know. It'd be interesting. But Pac is definitely a company guy. on a whole new level when it came to this match. Where people just don't like Orange Cassidy and they can never list the reasons why Orange Cassidy is bad for the business. Orange Cassidy is not bad for the business if he's been doing this for a really long time. So what is it about Orange Cassidy that you guys don't like that you feel that he's either killing the business, he's ruining the business, 
you know, if he's not for you, if you don't understand his style, that's totally fine. Pay for a product to watch other wrestlers other than the one you don't like. All right. Our main event of the evening. Over the weeks, these two guys have been feuding and it all comes to this magnificent main event. But we'll get there after I talk about everything. Jericho, he brought a choir to AEW Revolution to sing his theme song. And I was singing right along that choir. That was the most beautiful. Brought a choir to AEW Revolution to sing his theme song. And I was singing right along that choir. That was the most beautiful rendition of Judas by Fozzie that I've heard. And I am happy that Chris Jericho decided to do that. When you bring in outside talent, like that choir or having downstate or anybody in the music industry that has an awesome song or does a theme song, it adds a certain dynamic to the story, to the match and everything involved. And it just put Jericho on a higher pedestal when the choir was there. And that was a very, very good thing right before the, uh, the match. And then it's always good when the crowd sings along to your theme song too. I did not know that Jericho was a 182 day champion. Mox and Jericho, they brawl on the outside. Mox has a small advantage, and during this time, Jericho messes around with like, Moxley is bleeding profusely from the interesting I'm dynamic his between these two. Like, on top of his that eyebrow. It started in WWE the interesting and dynamic it basically between finishes these two in AEW, which is the interesting dynamic between these two. fantastic uh when they were brawling on the outside and into the fans i thought that was pretty cool it was different it showed that jericho could hurt his opponent no matter what there goes jericho jericho power bombs moxley onto the timekeeper's table that was a very dark move and and I love Jericho. Was not expecting him to do that. But then again, Jericho is pulling out all the stops so that way he could retain the AEW championship and celebrate with a little bit of the bubble. At one point during the match, Moxley converted the Lion Tamer into a Boston Crab. Jericho does a Lion Salt and then the Inner Circle interferes. On the outside where Jericho was Ortiz and Santana, they had interfered. And then also Jake Hager during the match had interfered. Mox had Jericho in a Boston Crab. That's when Hager had ran out. Jericho then does a code breaker to Mox and then puts Moxley in the Lion Tamer. Mox gets the upper hand and does the paradigm shift once. He then proceeds to take off the eye patch and everyone is surprised that his eye is okay. And congratulations to Moxley. What I find interesting is that Ambrose was in WWE for a very long time. He hit the shield. It worked. And then when Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns got injured, that just felt like, hey, this is a circumstance. You're there. Bam, here's the belt. But oh, wait, the two guys that got injured are finally recovered and healed. So you got to drop the belt and then you got to do stupid shit on TV. Winning the belt in AEW felt like a huge ass celebration. It felt like all the years that Moxie put into the business finally got rewarded the way that it should have got rewarded. Do I like the decision? 
No, because where do we go from here? He became champion. He had his moment. He celebration with the fans and he's talking on the mic and he's doing a huge baby face promo of saying that this belt is not mine. This belt belongs to all of us. I mean, the AEW universe, right? I get that. Those promos are cool, but who do you set up as his next opponent? And I had questioned this in my newsletter as well. I questioned it for a while, thinking about it. Like, who would be next in line to face Moxley? We could do a Pac versus Moxley, even though Pac lost to Kenny Omega. And you know the rankings are probably changed if Kenny ever wanted to do a singles match, just because. But the person that I could see right now would be to be Pac in that position to go face Moxley. And they would tell a fantastic story together. You know, does this mean that Moxley is still going to be doing New Japan tour dates while he's AEW champion? The last time that happened, Riho had to drop the belt to Nyla because it just wasn't working out. I don't want to see Moxley not be the strong champion that he could be to carry the company, you know, to put the belt on him and not know what to do afterwards, even though a even though Moxley had a really make an angle, make a program, and bam, there you go. You could jump off of that. But Nothing really happened. We had a huge main event title change. Nobody went out there to challenge Moxley or to even look him in the eye and, you know, try to be like, well, I'm going to be next. The same thing happened with the women's division. Nobody came out there to do an angle with Nyla, even if it's small, even if it was like, you know, a 10 second thing, like set up your next storylines so we can take a breather from the past and get ready for the new stuff. No one did that for the AEW Tag Team Championships. Private Party, you know, didn't come out to do something. Lucha Bros should have came out at that moment to make a name and be like, well, if the Young Bucks couldn't get the job done, maybe the Lucha Bros could get the job done because they could say that they're, they're way more brothers than the Young Bucks or something like that. It's just these tiny little details. And I understand that everything in wrestling when it comes to creating an event everything needs to be on time and coordinated but it just takes five seconds ten seconds to go out there and just do a small gesture i know it's lame i know that it's a formula but i want to know what's next because i want to talk about how the next storyline can happen how the best way to go about it because i love doing that in professional wrestling i love talking about how angles can go how you know the storylines should have went if we thought about and agreed on leaving the belt on jericho this is how i would have Continue the story between him and Moxley. And you guys might have gotten tired of it, but I probably wouldn't. It's just at this time, I don't know who's ready for the title picture in the company. According to my newsletter, I I enjoy Jericho carrying the company. However, I peaked those Fozzy dates, so maybe Jericho drops it. If Moxley gets the title, what will he do? Nothing to set up. So here's how we can keep this story going. This is in the event if Jericho had retained the title. Story. If Jericho retains the championship, Moxley should take out each inner circle member one by one. While Jericho is away, the inner circle guys need to hold down the place but are unsuccessful. When Jericho comes back from tour, Moxie versus Jericho 2 happens, and that's when Moxie dethrones Jericho. The only reason why I think it would have worked that way is because at that point, if Moxie is able to take out the inner circle guys one by one by one, You want to build your wrestlers as having almost all the obstacles in their way. Stop them. Chance. It's just like in real life. When life throws you obstacles, the end reward is just sweeter. 
And this is what professional wrestling should be doing. This is what AEW should be doing. AEW does a lot of amazing things. And I am so happy to always put the hat. And this is what professional wrestling should be doing. This is what AEW should be doing. AEW does a lot of amazing things. And I am so happy to always put the hashtag I'm with AEW because I believe in their message. I believe in their company. All the hard work all these guys done and I've seen them grow through all their hardships deserves to be where they're at. And they're on a main stage, whether it's WWE. And this is not me bashing WWE. It's just a matter of who handles who perfectly and who understands the business more. When you're not micromanaged, you're able to make stars and you're able to get the story you want to tell across the board. And this is what fans gravitate towards too. Letting wrestlers be people and letting wrestlers be people and investing the time to make them stars. To Aubrey Edwards, she is super cool on Twitter. I had tweeted out again. You guys can follow me on Twitter at Marie underscore Shadows, and I had tweeted out saying recording podcast at for AEW Revolution. Follow at Square Circle Pod, which is the other Twitter account for this and everything else podcast related. My next thing after this podcast is to work on the wrestling newsletter that I have been talking about during almost this whole entire podcast, which is squared circle podcast.substack.com awesome time at titan championship wrestling this past weekend with jd alpha on the aew unrestricted podcast and i have mentioned in this tweet also that cody rhodes is is And there was a point where he talks about what he looks for in a person who wants to work in the business. And I honestly want to do that. I always tend to do the work and go above and beyond. And Cody is just super, super cool. The first time that I met him uh, actually inspired me to continue to be in the professional wrestling business, even if WWE let me go three months into it. So I want to thank Everyone who has tuned in to this awesome episode of me reviewing AEW Revolution. I hope that you guys learned something from my passion. Retweet this. Share it with your friends. Let let them know on social media that Marie Shadows is here to talk about the professional wrestling business. And you guys can always find me on Twitter and the newsletter. And here is one last plug for everyone there. So if you enjoy the knowledge that you hear from me about the professional wrestling business, you can leave me a voice message. If you leave me a voice message, I will gladly play it on the podcast and talk about it. You guys can also support me if I am your favorite podcast person. 99 cents a month, a month, or $9.99 a month. Anchor gives you the ability to donate any amount to me to keep this podcast going because it takes a lot of work and effort to get these done and also to interview wrestlers. Free shares, free retweets, and that's about it. Again, ladies and gentlemen, again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Marie Shadows of the Square Circle Podcast, and I will see you guys on the next episode.